session 9 kubernetes pods by the end of this session what you will be able to understand is what are pods the life cycle and comparison of pods how do we create and manage pods what are the use cases for multi container pods what are init container pods and what are static pods and how to use how to create static pods in other words this session will focus only on pods quite comprehensive session the most important object in kubernetes is the pod and it is also the simplest a pod is what you run when you run something on kubernetes it is a small simple building block that you deploy on your cluster in reality a pod is one level of abstraction around a container pods and containers they are close siblings a container is an enclosed self-contained execution environment much like a process in operating system and pod is a pod encap encapsulates a group of these containers add storage resources networking configuration and rules for running the containers while you can run multiple containers in a pod in reality you often use one container per pod when designing your pods you don't force multiple containers into the same pod uh, in, into the same pod because there are specific regions to have multiple containers in one pod the life cycle you can understand very well uh, from this uh, diagram first is you create a manifest file where you declare your pod after the YML file is created, you use kubectl create or kubectl apply with hyphen f followed by the file name. We call it as manifest now. We send the manifest of the pod to the Kubernetes master. API server will receive it. It will handle the change request. So the etcd is where the, the configuration data and state will be stored. That will be the second step. Third controller is watching the etcd for any changes. So it is watch etcd for changes and since there is a change in the etcd it will hand over the details to the scheduler which will choose the node where this pod can be placed. So the next will be the node where the pod manifest will be sent and the details given in the pod manifest file will be used to pull the image instantiate the container and run the container in the pod this is the life cycle this is how everything works in kubernetes as far as pods are concerned in its life cycle a pod transitions through several stages a pod current stage is in is a tracked in the status field when you use get command kubectl get pod which has a sub field called phase when a pod state changes, the kubelet process on that node update the phase field in the pod's etcd entry. Pod can have these phases like pending, running, succeeded, failed or unknown. So when the manifest file, this is the manifest file, yml file is sent to the API server, the initial state is pending. Like if the server is busy and you are in the queue. So it will be in the pending state. If it failed to provision it, it will be in failed state. If it is successfully instantiated, created, then it will be in running state and the final will be succeeded. So these are all possible states or phases of the pod in its life cycle. So the pending state, sometimes what happens is you have a sequence of pods. Like first this should be created, then this should be created. So if we have a proper sequence decided, in that case uh, you will wait uh, and this pod will be in pending state till these two pods are created. So the pending is not just that you are running in the waiting in the queue before you want to fail, there are multiple regions. So pending API server has validated the pod means the definition and it created an entry for it in the etcd but its container have not been created or scheduled yet, not even scheduled. Running all the pods containers have been created. The pod has been scheduled on the node in the cluster and it is running its containers. Succeeded means 
every container in the pod has finished executing without returning errors or failing. The pod is considered to have completed successfully. None of the containers are going to be restarted. Succeeded means that. Failed. Every container has finished executing, but some of them have exited with a failure code. Unknown means status cannot be obtained from the store. So the first step is you create a YML file like this. API version, the kind, metadata, labels, specifications. So under spec you see we are giving the details for the containers. Name of the container, image for the container, ports which will be used by the container. This is the pod details you are specific, container details you are specifying under spec. So we can see four top level resources, API version. Now level, now you understand from the level, indentation wise they are at the same level. API, kind, metadata and spec. API version, kind, metadata and spec. Now you read it the way I told you. Dot API version field tells API group and the API version that will be used to create the object. Normally the format is API group slash version. However, pods are defined in special API group called core group which generally op omit the API group part. You see here API group is not given only the version is given. The second field kind, it tells Kubernetes the type of object being deployed. Then metadata is where we attach a name and the label. This helps us identify the object in the cluster and the labels has us uh, help us to create the loose couplings, the label selectors I was referring to. We can also define the namespace that uh, an object should be deployed to. Namespaces allow us to logically divide clusters for management purpose as we discussed in the previous lecture. Dot spec section is where we define any container that will run in the pod. In this case, we are deploying a pod with a single container based on this image. So to deploy this, you simply run the command kubectl apply hyphen f pod dot yml. The pod will be deployed in the default namespace because we are not giving namespace because the namespace is not given even in the manifest file. Information on pods. A pods status column is shown where you run kubectl get pods. So when you say kubectl get pods hyphen hyphen all namespaces, you will see the namespace and the name, status and restart and age. But if you get say describe, it will give you more comprehensive detail about that. In fact, if you use hyphen o yml, that will take the details to the next level because it will get the exact replica from the store as of today like a current status the conditions everything it is a quite comprehensive detail when you use this command hyphen o yml means you are saying give me the complete yml file interestingly this yml is much more wider in scope and detail uh, what you sent you sent a yml file to create the pod reason being what you sent was the definition part what is the current state? Everything is included in the hyphen o yml format. Even in fact, if you feel that uh, uh, the pod is going to take a lot of time to be provisioned to come uh, to come live. For example, if you are pulling an image which is around 500 MB size or 1 GB size, and then you are uh, installing additional software inside that, it may take a lot of time. So you can use hyphen hyphen watch lag to the kubectl get pods command so that you can monitor it and see when the status changes to running. The pod is being monitored by the local kubelet process. When you use hyphen hyphen watch, you can see the uh, progress and the status of the pod being created live. It's useful to create containers that use a custom command rather than having to create complete docker image. This is accomplished via command and argument field in your containers YML specification. The command replaces the image entry point entry which you specify in the docker file. 
the command that is executed to start your container. If you are overriding entry point in a YML file, it's common that we will point this to a shell executable like bin asset so that we can execute another command in that shell. And argument replaces the image CMD. Meaning, if you created an image with these uh, points, with these command entry point and CMD as we discussed, then argument ARGS will replace the CMD option of your image. Now the kubectl get command offers a couple of really simple flags that you give that will give you more information. Hyphen O wide. This flag gives a couple of more column but still a single line of output. Hyphen O YML flag. It takes the thing to the next level. It returns a full copy of the pod manifest from the cluster store. Is divided into two main parts like desired state that is dot spec and current observed state that is dot status. So desired is what you specified. Current is the dot status. Introspecting and deleting pods. You can log into it, execute commands in it. All can be done in the pod. We can do both of these things with kubectl exec command. This example shows uh, how to execute a psaux command in the first container of hello pod. kubectl execute hello pod pod name hyphen hyphen then there's a space here please be extremely careful watch it in the screenshot also there's a space and psaux and you can see the command inside this. Run the following command with uh, login. This command will log into the container. Execute hyphen it with the interactive terminal. Hello pod hyphen hyphen and then sh. So you are executing sh command inside the pod. Delete your pod by typing exit. So first you exit from your pod and then delete. kubectl delete. If you delete by the name of the pod interestingly it will come back. Why? Because you have not deleted the manifest. You have not deleted that YML file from the store. So deleting pod by the name of the pod will not delete it. However, to delete the pod, you have to supply the same manifest file, complete manifest file. kubectl delete hyphen f pod dot YML. This will delete the pod. Multi container pod. Very important topic for enterprise level workload. When an application needs several containers running on same host, the best option is to make a multi container pod with everything you need for the deployment of the application. Like here, for outside world you have a web server which is serving the files from a storage. This volume, this is a storage which is being populated by using from a repository using a file synchronizer pod I mean file, file synchronizer container so this container is populating the volume this container is running as a web server this is a very good example of multi container pod so but we don't we break one process per container rule here Yes, it does and definitely gives a hard time in troubleshooting. Above all, there are more pros than cons to it. For instance, more granular container can be reused between the team. So there are design patterns for this. What are the specific uh, possible scenarios for creating multi-container pods? That's called design patterns. The design patterns and use cases are for combining multiple containers into a single pod. There are three common ways to for doing it. One is sidecar pattern, second is adapter pattern and third is ambassador pattern. Let's understand all these three patterns when you need to put multiple containers in one pod. So what are the use cases and examples and how to do it? Let's go for one by one. Design patterns, sidecar pattern. This is app container where web server write to log files. 
this is another container inside this pod this is called sidecar which is actually doing some extra work for you sends the log file to a bucket so what is the meaning moral of the story here is app container is a really meaningful container for us sidecar is doing something which is not that crucial for the application to run but doing some extra cleaning up cleanup work or some extra work for you which is sending the log file to the bucket so this pattern consists of main application and a helper container with the responsibility that it will it is that is vital for your application but is not necessary as a part of the application and might not be needed for the main container to work this is sidecar pattern then we have adapter pattern app container is creating complex monitoring output which is not recognized by our monitoring application so the external monitoring application requires that output in a given format a specific format so we create another container which will simplify the monitoring output and will reproduce it in the format which can be used by the outer uh, external monitoring tools so adapter pattern if i look at it from that angle and if i compare it from real life example this i'll say that is a peon office boy which is not intelligent enough he is just making the job that okay i can place this point from this file from here to there and i can do that hard work the donkey level work but if you look at this it is working like a horse or secretary so uh, the you know important person for you who is doing the job for you who is presenting the things in a given format so intelligent so intelligence is the important difference between the two here it is used to standardize the output by the primary container standardizing refer to the format to format the output in a specific manner that fits the standards across your application for example to expose a standardized monitoring interface to the application even though the application does not implement it in the standard way that is adapter pattern third is ambassador pattern app container need a database connection so which database connection you need different database connections for different requirement for example we have ambassador which proxies the database connection maybe for production different for test different and for local different data so it is used to connect containers with the outside world the helper container can send network request on behalf of the main application it is a proxy to allow other containers to connect to a part of uh, to a port on the local host it is a pretty useful pattern especially when you are migrating your legacy application into the cloud so these are the main design patterns how can the communication happen between the multi container pods there are three primary ways that container in a pod can communicate with each other one is the shared network namespace second storage volumes third shared process namespaces let's understand these three different ways for the communication so communication inside a multi container pod shared network namespace container 1 listening on port number 3001 container 2 listening on port number 3000 on local host we can connect to any of these ports using the shared network namespace so all the containers in a pod share same network namespace therefore all containers can communicate with each other in on the local host for instance we have two containers in the same pod listening on port number 8080 and 8081 respectively container 1 can talk to container 2 on the different port in this case 3001 and 3000 3, respectively then we can also have a shared volume like container 1 is also writing to the storage volume container 2 is also writing to the shared storage so one is writing one is reading so we can have a, a exchange of information all containers can have the same volume mounted so that they can communicate with each other by reading and modifying files in the storage volume and third is shared process namespace so here we have a containers container 1 container 
this is uh, to communicate where shared process namespace is used with this container inside the pod can signal each other for this is to be enabled we need to have a setting shared process namespace to true in the pod specification file the spec paragraph how can we deploy a multi container pod that's a very interesting example let's deploy a multi container pod we can define our multi container pod in a yml file pod metadata name multi pod specification restart policy never volume so we are using a shared volume to share the information which is empty directory containers name image volume mount share data mount path please listen carefully and watch carefully this example so nginx container is web server which is using a user share nginx html but there is no file here where it is mounted it is mounted under shared data that means i can use the shared data mount point in another container where i can write to so where that data will go the data will go into this directory let's see and this is the ne next container is ubuntu container image is ubuntu volume mounted shared data yes so we are using the same mount point here shared data mount path is production data or pod data command is bin sh and arguments is hello world so what we are doing here is we are using bin sh command with echo echo hello world and we are sending that to pod data index.html meaning this index.html will go to this directory this is populated with the name shared data this shared data is mounted on this location which will be uh, which will be uh, populated and which will be served by nginx web server in other words one container is writing the uh, website data and another container web server is reading the data from the same shared uh, volume so we can define our multi container pod in a yml file the first step is to create this file in this yml file you will see that we have deployed a container based on nginx image as our web server the second container named ubuntu container is deployed based on the ubuntu image and write the text hello world to the index.html file that is served by the first container because of it is mounted at this location where we are writing it creating it and then the, it is the, the name shared volume is share data which is being used by nginx container to serve the files from so to deploy it same command kubectl apply hyphen f multipod once the pod is deployed we can change it to the running state you have to access the nginx container with the command kubectl execute hyphen it multipod and nginx container so you are executing it now we can use curl local host from the container because you are at the bash prompt of nginx container from nginx which is nothing but a web server you can run the curl command to get the data so to make sure second container does its job uh, or not you can try the curl and you should see hello world printed out which is means the second container has populated the volume first container is reading from that and both these containers are in the same pod what are the advantages of multi container pods the primary purpose of a multi container pod is to support co located co managed helper processes for primary application with the same network namespace shared volumes and same ipc namespace it is possible for these containers to efficiently communicate ensuring the data locally locality they enable you to manage severally uh, several tightly coupled application containers as single unit another reason is that uh, all containers have the same life cycle which should run on the same node that's the advantage of multi container pods init containers this is a very interesting use case where you want uh, certain containers to be launched in a given sequence because you have a situation where you cannot uh, launch one container before another container or before another pod is launched successfully 
so these init containers run to accomplish run to completion before the main apps container and the pod will repeatedly restart until all of them succeed you can use init containers to perform tasks before the rest of the pod is deployed pod can have init containers in addition to application containers init containers allow you to reorganize setup scripts and binding code because of the facility they give you uh, to specify the orders an init container can contain and run utilities that are not desirable to include in the app container image or for security reasons or can contain utilities or custom code for setup that is not present in the app image for example there is no requirement to make an image from another image just to use tools like scd or python or dig during setup or you can use linux namespaces so that they have different file system views from your app containers such as access to secrets that application containers are not able to access init container contains utilities or setup scripts not present in an app image making it lightweight they always run to completion they execute sequentially that's what i was referring to and each of the init container must succeed before the next can run they support all the fields and features of app containers including resource limits volumes and security settings how do we create a pod with init container see here kind metadata name and here in the specification we are specifying init containers and this is the list element in yml with when you specify hyphen that means this is one entry and if you have multiple entries of the same nature you will type another hyphen so this is another entry so the first init container is init busybox1 with this image with this command and then second one is this so first this container will be launched this pod will be launched and after that this container will be launched and this is the main one this i am the main container so here this in this example we have two init containers where the first container will simply print a message and second one will sleep for 30 seconds after which the our main container will come into action that's the point important they run to the completion so first these two containers will be completed means first container will run will print the message this will sleep for 30 second well, after 30 second this main container will run will will print this message so when you bring this pod up and you get similar kind of message uh, what you see here kubectl apply hyphen f status you can check with this and pod comes to the completion after minimum of 30 second that is the sleep time with get pods you can get the details of the pods deployed how it works actually interestingly first the kubelet will wait until the networking and storage are ready so that it can start running in its containers it then runs the pod in its containers in the order they appear in the pod specification each in its containers must exit successfully before the next containers starts a pod cannot be in a ready state until all the init containers have succeeded if the pod restarts or is restarted all init containers are executed again what are the use cases init containers can contain utilities or custom code for setup that are not present in the app image they can be given access to the secrets that app containers cannot access or they can be used to clone a repository into a volume before you actually start your main container which will be using this repository contents it can also be used to wait for a service to start that can be used that is to be used required by main application an init container is a good candidate for deploying or delaying the application initialization until one or more dependencies are available 
that's what uh, the main use cases are where we can use init containers then uh, the question answer of the question static pod static pods are managed directly by the kubelet daemon on a specific node without the api server observing them so they will not be uh, observed they will not be managed by the api server unlike pods that are managed by the control plane instead the kubelet watches each static pod it restart if it fails static pods are always bound to one kubelet on a specific node kubelet automatically tries to create a mirror pod on the kubernetes api server for each static pod that is just a mirror not a real so even if you delete the mirror pod it will come back instantly this means that pod running on the node are visible in the api server but cannot be controlled from there the pod names will be suffixed with the node host name within a leading hyphen how do we create static pods we can configure static pods with either a file system hosted configuration file or web hosted configuration file file system hosted configuration file you can use static pod path and the path name that is directory in the kubelet configuration file which periodically scan the directory which is listed here and create delete static pod as specified in the file located in this directory the kubelet will ignore files starting with the dots when scanning the specific directory so whatever deployment you create in this directory will be scanned by kubelet configuration file and will provision and create the static pod look at this example first go to the tester one this is a practical example in our case go to the tester one make a directory etc kubelet kubelet dot d because this is where uh, we will create this static web configuration so choose a directory of your choice let's say kubelet.d and place a web server pod definition there this is example make a directory and this is our static web.yml file so make a directory this is a screen grab configure your kubelet on the node to use the directory by running it with pod manifest path argument so for that edit this uh, etc kubel kubernetes kubelet to include this file this line is not there by default so kubelet arguments cluster dns cluster domain and pod manifest file this is what you are entering here this is what you are adding here or add the static pod path this field in the kubelet configuration file and then restart kubelet on that particular node so the pod will be created second option is web hosted static pod manifest kubelet periodically download a file specified by manifest url and interpret it as a json or yml file that contains the pod definitions if there are changes to the list of static pod kubelet will apply them create a yml file and store it on a web server this cannot be tried but this is for explanation purpose only the previous example you can try on your system so put it on a web server so that you can pass it uh, pass the url of that file to the kubelet configure the kubelet on your selected node to use this web manifest by running it with manifest url equal to this url something like this kubelet argument cluster dns cluster domain and manifest var url this is where your yml file is and restart it observe static pod behavior when kubelet starts it automatically starts all the defined static pod you can view the running container by uh, using docker ps command or podman ps command on that tester one machine you can see the mirror pod also on the uh, api server by running kubectl command there if you try to delete kubectl to delete the mirror pod from the api server kubelet does not remove the static pod it will you see that again and uh, you will notice that pod is still visible back on tester one you can try to stop the docker container manually that's it thank you so much team